Good evening, everyone. My name is Neil Drennan, and on behalf of on behalf of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'd like to welcome you to the library's online author event this evening. The Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges the Wadwurrung and Eastern Ma original elders of the land on which our library services operate. We pay respect to the Wadwurrung and Eastern Ma elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and celebrate First Nations people of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy and knowledge and story. Now, there's just a few housekeeping um, details tonight. Uh, you can participate in this live webinar by clicking on the Q&A button and typing your question or comment. You may need to touch your screen to see the Q&A function if you are using an iPad or an iPhone tonight. Um, I will just add that I have lots of your questions already and we'll be asking Matthew these in the course of the evening tonight. Um, also, this webinar is being recorded. So if you'd like to watch this discussion again or re recommend it to friends or family, it will upload to the library's YouTube channel within the next couple of days. Before we begin, a little bit of background about me. I'm the author of The Devil's Grip, the story of the Wetton Hall murders in 1992 two as well as six other novels and I also have the claim to fame of being included in a short story collection nearly 20 years ago with Matthew Rowick. It is now my very great pleasure to introduce one of the stars of Australian fiction, Matthew Rowley, whose books have sold over seven and a half million copies worldwide. He's the author of a dozen novels and novellas, and he is the sort of famous that people ask him what his favourite food is. So we've got lots of great questions tonight, but he is also so generous on his website that all, all that and more can be found if you just look Matthew Rowley up. Scarecrow and Army of Thieves <laughs> was the biggest selling fiction title in, in Australia in 2011. Many of Matthew's books have been the biggest selling Australian titles of their year of release. Seven Ancient Wonders, Five Greatest Warriors, The Tournament, The Great Zoo of China, The Four Legendary Kingdoms, The Three Secret Cities and The Secret Runners of New York. Go big or go home. Isn't that your words, Matthew? <laughs> That's exactly right. Hi, Neil. Thank you for having me. Hello, everybody, and welcome. The clock is ticking. Humanity is on the precipice as climate change waves its fist at Mother Nature. A global pandemic threatens civilizations and despots govern the world's most powerful nations. As the doomsday clock clicks ever closer to midnight, it's good to know that Jack's back. That's right. Jack West Jr. and his tireless entourage of adorable superheroes <laughs> might just save the world. And if they don't, they'll have a hell of a time trying. When the apocalyptic bell tolls, what will you be reading? Hello, Matthew. You are talking to us from Los Angeles tonight at a very late hour or early hour indeed. It is 1.30 in the morning here right now. So, yep. <laughs> We're very lucky to have you. Um, please tell me that the reason, tell us that the reason you are in LA is because you are in top secret talks about a Matthew Riley theme park that will make Universal Studios look like Luna Park. I, uh, I actually have uh, recently sold the television rights to the Jack West series uh, to a pretty big company called Spyglass Media. So they are looking to do a television show. And yeah, part of the reason I'm in LA is to, to do a bit more movie stuff. And to get a TV show of the Jack West series and to do justice to you know, the scale of the books, you have to be here because you, you're talking about a series which could conceivably have a, a per episode budget, which is really up there. So, yeah, that's exactly why I'm here. And, of course, that was one of my other questions was, has this not happened because there is no budget big enough? That's exactly right. Uh, that's the hardest part. I, I, I sort of... Uh, the phrase architect of your own demise comes to mind. Uh, when I started writing the books way back with Contest and Ice Station, I said, I have no budget. I can blow up submarines. I can have nuclear missiles hitting ice shelves. In Scarecrow, I had an aircraft carrier blow up. When you go to film that, it becomes expensive. And uh, that's what happens. You, I've come close. Ice Station came close at Paramount. Hover Car Racer came close at Disney. The Great Zoo of China came very close at Sony, but you're talking $100 million movies and the average studio only makes, you know, four or five of those every year. 
unless you're Disney, in which case they make about 12. It's got to happen. It's just got to happen. Um, <laughs> we should get right down. We shouldn't waste any time getting down to business of, of the two lost mountains. Uh, you've yes. got a few hundred fans joining us tonight, which is really exciting. Um, all wanting to know if they can expect the ride of their lives. Uh, we're barreling towards the conclusion of this series. We've gone 76543. And with the three secret cities, we really started the end game of, of the Jack West series. And so Two Lost Mountains really continues straight on from Three Secret Cities, uh, which had a bit of a, a scary ending uh, involving Lily and a uh, ritual sacrifice at the Rock of Gibraltar. That gets uh, settled on page one uh, of this book. And what you're going to find with, with Two Lost Mountains is, is Jack is racing around the world again, but this time he's a long way behind. This is almost a chase story. And Jack is the chaser in this one. He's outgunned and out information. Uh, and there's a really fun new villain who turns up, a general from the uh, secret royal world who, uh, who was so, uh, so good that uh, the royals actually put him in Erebus prison uh, and now he's out. Uh, and he's, he's a whole new level of bad. If that's even possible. <laughs> this world of yours is a parallel universe, Matthew. Um, do you want to just talk a bit about how this kind of, you know, very kind of controlled dude like yourself and this other world exist together? Uh, you know, it, um, it's funny. The, this notion of, you know, uh, some royal families, you know, ruling the world from the shadows, uh, it, was, it was just a, an idea that I, that I liked. And I actually slipped it back into, you know, in Six Sacred Stones and Five Greatest Warriors where... Back in Six Stones, we saw an image of, of five warriors standing be behind four kings. And uh, for those really sort of close readers of my books out there, so much of what we're reading now was actually set up in the Six Sacred Stones. Seven Nation Wonders was, was really a standalone book. It was the first one. But I enjoyed it so much that when I set out to write the next one and called it the Six Sacred Stones, I figured I was you know, committing myself to a seven book series. So much of what we're reading was set up in Six Sacred Stones. And even now, as, as I'm writing the one, um, even just earlier today or yesterday, um, I'm still revealing things that were in the Six Sacred Stones. Uh, and so, yeah, it was in Four Legendary Kingdoms that this sort of shadow royal world really was revealed. And it's been really fun to sort of populate it, to bring out the bounty hunters, the Knights of the Golden Eight, to bring out a general like Raster who, who comes out in this book. So uh, I, I really just love that notion. And uh, unfortunately right now, conspiracy theories, sadly are, are really in vogue, uh, at least here in the United States. And who knows which, is, which ones are true and which ones aren't. Maybe we could also add that in the back of the, of the new book, there is a whole interview that, where you talk about all of this stuff, isn't there? Which is really useful uh, if we don't cover everything tonight for you. You know, um, we've, we've done these interviews. They were the original, they were the brainchild of my publisher, Kate Patterson, and we've done them since the start. And it's a great way to sort of uh, have a conversation with the reader and, and, and talk about, you know, we, I sit down with Kate and we say, and my editor, Alex Lloyd, and we say, if you had just finished the book, what question would you want to ask me? And so that's how we come up with the questions. So yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. Um, the interviews are great. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, there are some strange characters that particularly fascinated me, the Vandals being one of them, these sort of yes. point nun eaters. Um, what was the origin of them? Is that, should I, should I, I have caught that, caught up with them in an earlier book? So there was a Vandal in one of the earlier books and his name was Mephisto and he was in the four legendary kingdoms. And uh, again, the eagle eyed readers. And let me start again. I assume that my readers are following very, very closely. And so Mephisto was a diminutive guy with a red tattooed face and filed teeth. And uh, he did horrible things to some of the minotaurs uh, in the four legendary kingdoms. And so when it came time to write The Two Lost Mountains, I thought, 
let me show readers of this series that there are other Mephistos out there. Uh, and it's entirely possible that Mephisto, you may discover, could have a brother who may get pissed that, you know, Jack, you know, shoved Mephisto out the window of an aeroplane uh, in the Four Legendary Kingdoms two books ago. So, yeah, the, the, uh, what I'm doing is I'm really revealing more of the world as we get into these last few books and saying that Mephisto was part of a group. Uh, that we call the Vandals. And maybe this notion of Vandals goes back to Rome and the people who sacked Rome 2,000 years ago. Yeah, well, they're not nice, that's for sure. Um, sure. <laughs> <laughs> with, this, with this year's lockdown, Lost Mountains is a passport to vicarious international travel, really. In the mm. first 100 pages, we've gone from the altar of Gibraltar to Australia to pick up a spare prosthetic arm in a hover-capable Su-37 fighter bomber, then on to Moscow. Now, I had to do a little bit of homework and I found that the thrust vector control allow, allows manoeuvres at speeds nearing zero without angle of attack limitations. Is that what you mean by hover-capable? Yep. Yep. Uh, it, yeah, the Su-37 is, hover, is, is hover-capable in real life. So it is a... Uh, a Russian hovering plane. Which, of course, I'm sure your, your, your more uh, seasoned readers will know exactly which of the creations in the books are real and which are made up, but I certainly did some investigation, and that was part of no, it. No, it's something I, I assume now that readers will have their smartphone next to them as yeah. they read a book, so I think it's actually incumbent upon me uh, more and more that even though the books get more and more fantastical in some ways, a lot of the tech and the hardware are real and you can look them up and you, you'll be able to find a, a Sukhoi online. Yeah. Uh, and even most of the places, you know, you can look up Moscow and Red Square and St. Basil's. Um, one of my favourite places in this book, uh, without spoiling it too much, is Mont Saint-Michel in yeah. northern France at the Normandy beaches. And I assume people, when they read Mont Saint-Michel, and there's a picture of it in the book, but I urge readers to Google it and have a look at just how magnificent this place is. I visited it back in 2003 and was always going to write about it. So, yeah, I assume readers will be Googling uh, this sort of stuff. And I mean, it's great read. Can, and it's great that we have much bigger TVs now because virtual tourism is really going to be a thing, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, it's going to be a long while. Uh, you quote Abraham Lincoln at the start of the book. If you want to test a man's character, give him power. I remember using a similar Celtic quote myself once, which is never give the sword to a man who cannot dance. Do you think power is actually given or is it only ever taken? That's a really good question. Um, no, I, I think sometimes, sadly, it's inherited. And I think this is one of the big themes that I went into back in Four Legendary Kingdoms and moving through uh, sort of Hades and Dion, his son, uh, and then the rise of Sphinx as one of the watchmen of the city of Atlas, uh, one of the three secret cities, that the notion of monarchies yep. is flawed because the power that you pass down to somebody, they may not be that bright. And so, yeah, I would actually say that... Uh, power then can be taken uh, because sometimes if it's inherited, it's incredibly unstable. Uh, even, you know, the rise of the United States came with King George III, who was a mad king. Mm. Uh, and, you know, if you, uh, you know, mad kings throughout history have lost their empires because suddenly the empire rebelled. Yeah, it's just it's one of those broader questions of power, which obviously is a recurring thing in all of your books about yeah. that notion that where they say power is 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 never given, it's only ever taken. Um, yeah. I want to back up a bit and imagine what you were like as a kid. Like, say we were eight years old, and uh, what would backyard role playing games have looked like with you, Matthew Rowley? You know, I I haven't really changed that much. You can. Uh... You can see uh, Django Fett up there on the uh, on top of the uh, the cabinet. Um, Indiana Jones sits on my desk here. Uh, 
as a kid, uh, now I would have been playing, um, you know, Luke Skywalker against Stormtroopers and I would have been, yeah, I was directing the show. Uh, so, yeah, to me it was, it was Luke Skywalker and Han Solo and uh, running around going pew, 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 pew. And, uh, so you had all your mates in parts playing along with it. Sure did, yeah. And we'd be, you know, crawling underneath the house and climbing trees and... Uh, Oh yeah, we were doing that. And uh, honestly, if I were a kid now, I'd be using my iPhone and getting lenses from the new iPhones <laughs> and filming my Star Wars action figures. I used to, I used to, I built a, you'd call it a diorama now, but I built a set of um, Jabba the Hutt's palace from Return of the Jedi complete with Jabba and a trap door and below it was the Rancor pit. So Luke Skywalker and the Gamorrean guard both, I pulled a string and the trap door opened and they fell down into the pit. So, and obviously this is back in the uh, ancient days of the 1980s. Uh, today I, I'd be filming this on a camera. I'd be editing it on my laptop and I'd be putting Star Wars music to it. Oh yeah, that's what I was doing then. <laughs> and so were you the good guy or the bad guy or you, or you could do both i was always a good guy <laughs> you can there see you many... can definitely see you can see that in the books <laughs> there are very real locations in your books and then there are these fantastical events do to what extent do you examine like plans of st basil's or maps of jerusalem or airspace over libya i mean it, is that all happening in in there <laughs> yes Yes, uh, actually, I did have plans of St. Basil's uh, as I went through this. And fortunately, my, my editor, uh, Alex Lloyd, had been there uh, in the last uh, year or two. Uh, I, am, I honestly tell people you could go on a tour of the New York Public Library using my book contest. You could take yourself on a tour of the old city of Istanbul from my book, The Tournament. Uh, and so, yeah, the plans of St. Basil's, the... Uh, the description of Mont Saint-Michel, uh, the river, the frozen over river in Moscow, which is the scene of a, a big opening action scene. Uh, this is all legit. This is all something you can go and look up. Uh, and again, it's like that same thing. People are, re people are looking these things up as they're reading it. Uh, and I think that sells, the reality sells the fantastical elements. Uh, and as long as it's grounded in reality, you can do a lot of things with your story. And I always felt from the start of the Jack West series, I, I knew with Raiders of the Lost Ark and even say Back to the Future, the audience will let you have one moment of let's call it magic or, or fantasy. And so, you know, from the, the sun, you know, beaming, you know, a beam of light down to the, the capstone of the pyramid in Seven Wonders, I've always found that my readers will allow me one element of, you know, historical, you know, phenomena. And so as long as you're grounded in a reality, uh, people say, okay, I'll jump on the ride. And I think I, I lo back in the start of my career, I used to get emails through my website, people reading my books and they'd write to me, dear Mr. Riley, I read your book, I Station, and I found it completely unbelievable and unrealistic. And I'm happy to say that all of those people, we've got rid of them now. They've realised they don't like a Matthew Riley book. And the people who do read my books and hopefully the ones you know, watching this right now, they enjoy the outrageous action, but because it's grounded in that very, very real reality. Of course, and it, just interestingly, because there are some questions coming through about writing, um, it might be worth just adding. Sure. You, the first book that you you did, you kind of funded the publication of yourself, didn't you? It was it was a self published book um, before Pan um, Macmillan. Ever. I did. Yeah, yeah. So um, this one, it's one of the original self published contests with the publisher's logo on the spine, it was discovered in uh, Angus and Robertson Pitt Street Mall in Sydney in uh, <laughs> January of nineteen ninety seven. It was found. Yeah. <laughs> And I should mention that no, no other publisher ever called me, just the one, just yeah. the one. And it's probably worth mentioning uh, to two aspiring writers that, I mean, the po possibilities for self-publication now are much 
greater than they were back then too. I mean, um, oh. you know, there's, there are so many more options for people who want to, uh, you know, create, get not only gain their own following, but publish their own actual or, or uh, digital book. Oh, without a doubt. If I were doing it now, I'd be, I'd be doing it online. Um, but you also do have to market yourself. You do have to tell people that your book is out there. That's right. And we can only, I can only assume that everyone with their social media who's 20 years old now is running rings around me in that department. <laughs> me too. Me too. <laughs> um, so as, as one of the world's best-selling authors, can you share with us some of the extraordinary aeronautical technologies you have flown in yourself and what weapons you have been allowed to play with? Oh, I've been, I've been in a, a fair amount of helicopters. Uh, the weapons are probably more interesting that I, I did have some fans in the uh, uh, two commander regiment in Australia. So I've, I've been to some of their training and uh, been in the presence of grenades going off and uh, they foolishly handed me a uh, automatic salt rifle and let me fire that. There's a photo somewhere of that. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, be the best one was, uh, at Holsworthy Base, they have a training facility uh, complete with a, uh, a built-up embassy. And they put me in a jumpsuit, handed me a, a paintball gun, an actual gun, which had been converted to fire paint rounds. And they send me into the embassy and they say, okay, go in there and hide somewhere and we'll hunt you down. And so they came in and they hunted me down. At the end of it, they found me and I got off a few shots. And then suddenly it's like, you know, I just have shots there and there. Um, that's pretty awesome. And when you see some of the other things they've got there that they can train inside, whether it's buildings or, or mock-ups of aeroplanes, uh, that sort of stuff informs the books uh, very, very well. And what about yeah, like- pretty, pretty lucky that way. What about planes and hornets? And uh, have, have you been in, in many of those sorts of aircraft or? Actually, you know, not so many. I, I can't say I've been in a have been in a Sukhoi thirty seven. Um, <laughs> probably helicopters, uh, but really no. Um, uh, I mean, it's funny you when you live here in the states, you actually see attack choppers flying overhead. Even here in you know downtown, you know west side of Los Angeles, you'll see Black Hawk helicopters flying overhead. Or if you go to the Rose Bowl, you'll see a stealth bomber fly over. Uh, but yeah, can't say I've been in any of them. I thought they would have been clamouring to have you have you photograph walking out of one. They give you a ride to that. <laughs> I'd be on to that. I'd, you. <laughs> you know, I, I I live in I live in hope and fear that the CIA is going to knock on my door one day because if they looked at my Google searches, I'd be in big trouble. So you haven't ever thought about going into politics then? No, no, I you know. Maybe when I was younger, but I don't think that's for me. Um, did Vladimir Putin's niece actually lose one of her fingers during the writing of this recent book, this latest book? This I really, I really hope not. And uh, again, as I mean, the inclusion of Aloysius Knight in the Jack West series, uh, giving him this fabulous entrance in the Three Secret Cities and having him stay around in two lost mountains has been one of the most fun things I've done. Uh, you may not be aware, but I, I did the crossover in the four legendary kingdom, four legendary kingdoms of bringing scarecrow into the Jack West series. Aloysius Knight, he appeared in 2003 in, in my novel scarecrow uh, as this bounty hunter who's shadowing scarecrow. And while all these other international bounty hunters are trying to kill scarecrow, it, it emerges that, Aloysius Knight is there to protect him and somebody's paid him to, to protect Scarecrow. And so he's just been this wonderful character. And I'm often asked, would he get his own book? Uh, but I sort of, I committed myself to the Jack West series. So an Aloysius Knight book just really wasn't on the cards. And so bringing him in, having that skydive entrance in the Three Secret Cities I was so happy when I came up with that. If Jack West is going to be held in a prison from which nobody has ever escaped, who's going to get him out? And in the Matthew Riley universe, and it's sort of become this Matthew Riley universe, 
Aloysius Knight is the guy who would do it. Uh, so yeah, he's um, uh, he, he's great. He's a lot of fun. He's like he's like writing Mother from the Scarecrow books. You can do Aloysius Knight can say almost anything, and it's fabulous. So, is, are these books translated into Russian? Yes, they are. They are. They do, you are. do you reckon? Do you reckon Putin would have read? It's hard to say. <laughs> hey, he he seems a. Uh, he actually does look like a guy who would read a lot and. It's funny, the, the, the really sort of smart power players I've met in my life do read fiction. Uh, they, it keeps their minds active. Uh, but yes, I am published in Russian and uh, the Jack West books are published there. So who knows? That's amazing. But yeah, I'm pretty sure his niece is okay with uh, all, all the fingers and toes. Uh, okay. But that, oh, I should mention the train system underneath southern moscow uh which is mentioned in two lost mountains is real oh my god i thought that had to be made up for sure that, oh. that's real that's real look it up what's it wow. called uh D, d6 i think it is look up just google vladimir putin's secret train line uh, <laughs> under moscow um now you do you worry about the pope at all i mean you know the, the, you know you 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 go to some sort of dicey places with the with the uh, Vatican. What well, any, anybody who's read the tournament knows I can go further. Um, but that that's really historical. This is like, <laughs> well, you know, it, I'm I'm very careful to make sure that I'm I'm only mentioning when it comes to the Vatican and the Church. Um, I mean, they've had a they've had a real problem. Uh, with institutional sexual abuse now uh, it actually it goes back a thousand years but in the last 25 years it's emerged and I, I'm not so sure you can even talk about the Vatican without mentioning that and you know I'm someone who was brought up I went to a Catholic primary school I went to a Catholic high school I was educated by Jesuits one of them went to jail uh, later on so it's something that I was sort of quite close to and I can't say I'm particularly religious now, uh, but yeah, no, if, if it, one of the questions I have, if in, in, in this is explored in two lost mountains is, you know, the Vatican is a men only environment. Yeah. Um, the Omega monks are, are that taken to the extreme. That, that's what the Omega monks are. And of course they were set up, uh, back in Three Secret Cities. So I don't think I'm sort of breaking new ground there. Uh, you could probably say I'm, I'm more breaking new ground, suggesting that the Catholic Church is the modern incarnation of a sun cult. Um, uh, but the evidence for that is actually there as well. Yeah. Yep. Um, just quickly, what other languages uh, have you been translated in, into? Because that's always fascinating to know. Oh, my goodness. Um, it's over 20 now and um, German, Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, still not French, still no French publishing of Matthew Riley, probably because of what I did about the French in the early books, but um, Thai, Japanese, Chinese, Russian, Bangladeshi, um, uh, uh, Bulgaria, I'm big in Bulgaria. They've published all of my books in Bulgaria. So, yeah, um, the funny thing is, and, and this is just a quirk of being Australian, is that we speak English. And so the two biggest markets for us are the UK and the US, and there's Australia also being published in English. Wow, wow. that's pretty pretty amazing, pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, I remember having, a, uh, I had a bookshop down in Victoria for nearly a decade, which I've sold now, but I, I remember for a long time, all of these Jack West Jr. series were incredible step up books for kids. Like for kids, yeah. sometimes who you'd think were like, really? They're reading this at like 10 years old. Um, but I'd often have uh, customers saying, well, where's the new Matthew Rowley then? We'll give him that. And that and that, those, those Matthew Rowley books lasted for these kids probably from, you know, from 10 to 16, like you could, they could have one every year. And I remember yeah. reading tournament myself and suddenly 
saying to some of them, oh, this is this is sort of <laughs> this yeah. is Matthew Riley, but not as as I expected. So um have there been like was that is that the biggest departure that you've made genre-wise with with books? Yes, yes. And and that was why the tournament comes with a, an author's uh, note, a little warning on the first page. Um, unfortunately, there were obviously there were going to be people who who bought that book without reading that little warning on the first page. Um, the tournament is definitely a, a book which sort of stands apart from all of my other stuff, which is really open. All of everything else is openly escapist, and the tournament. It was just this book that I, I felt I had to write. It was just in me. And the actual premise for it, you know, the, the Sultan of the Islamic like Empire him. hosting a chess tournament, inviting every king to send his best player, and then having, you know, cheating and poisoning and murders ensuing. That all came flooding out of me in one rush in one day. Uh, and that's never happened with any of the other books. And so... You know, I was that author who turned up at my publishers and said, hey, I've, you know, I'm the action author and now I've written this historical mystery with, you know, sex and wanton violence in it. Um, what, it's actually what, what you said before about the young people who read the books. Um, yeah, you know, I write my books for, for adult readers. But if people ask me, you know, what would a younger reader prefer, I generally direct them to start with, say, Troll Mountain, Hover Car Racer. Uh, there's nothing really sort of offensive or violent in them. Then they sort of move to, to contest. Yes. And if, if, you, if you wanted to really sort of split hairs, I'd, I'd direct a younger reader to the adventure of Jack West with Seven Wonders before the, the sort of the thriller of the Scarecrow books, which I think are a little more harder edged than the Jack West books. So really when you were doing these, this was kind of the crossover really between the child and yourself and, and the, you know, the, uh, the adult thriller writer that just happened yeah. to work that way for, for these younger readers. It, it, yeah. it wasn't you or originally thinking, oh, I'll write for a, a teen market or I'll, I'll write for a tween market or whatever. This, that's just the way it's, it's worked out. You know, it's, it's sort of a funny thing. Um, I mean, and I found this with The Secret Runners of New York. Uh, the Secret Runners of New York has some teen protagonists. But in my mind, it's an adult book. It's a book for mature readers. And yet publishers around the world sort of grappled with it and said, oh, Matthew Riley's writing a young adult YA book. And I sort of went, okay, if that's how you want to sell it, just because your lead characters are teenagers uh, or even children. To Kill a Mockingbird, is, is it a children's book just because the, the two lead characters are, are children? Uh, I think what separates Seven Wonders from, say, Ice Station is the presence of Lily. Uh, and this was what I really set out to do right from the start, and it continues with the, the Jack West series, that Jack and Zoe and Pooh Bear and Stretch were these hard-bitten soldiers, and it's this little girl who softens them. And I think maybe younger readers jumped onto the Jack West series because there was a kid in their midst and there's, I love this sort of idea in the world that you cannot fool children. You know, a kid will call this, this hard bitten uh, United Arab Emirates demolitions expert, she'll call him Pooh Bear because he's got a big beard and is a, is a little bit overweight. Uh, you can't fool kids. And so I think kids jumped onto that with the Jack West series. And yeah, it does sort of tap into something in me as well. Um, you know, it's really easy to to look at, read your books, and 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 just enjoy enjoy the daring do and the goodies and the baddies and stuff. But I just recently was watching an ABC uh, special called Soldiers of Fortune, which was about this well a number of people, but a, a private mercenary force that was that was headed up by an Australian called Christian Durant. Um, and I just wondered, you know, how much that sort of stuff. Uh, are you absorbing and 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 tuning into media wise when you when you you're writing the, these supposedly fictional stories a lot a lot and um uh, even just off the top of my head i i remember when i was back in australia seeing this very very brief documentary about the um 
how how soldiers become members of the SAS and the uh, the initiation and the, the the testing that you have to go through, and the SAS copped a little bit of flack at the time for revealing this stuff that they did, but I was eating it up. Um, increasingly, you know, when I was a teenager, I was reading a lot of fiction in my twenties, reading a lot of fiction, you know, discovering the state of the art, but now I read much more nonfiction that's feeding my brain to anybody out there looking to write a book. You don't just sit out on the beach and go, "Hmm, where's that story. You need to input stuff into your brain and eventually you tap into it later as you write that book. You, you don't just come up with ideas out of thin air. I'm, I'm always reading document, reading nonfiction, reading a book at the moment called The Biggest Bluff about a, a woman who took up uh, professional poker playing just to look at the psychology of that. Um, even for the tournament, re- that the tournament stemmed. I'd done all this historical research into Elizabeth and the Tudors and the Islamic Empire but it was reading about a junior chess championship where people cheated that really triggered the notion of, oh, what if there was this big ancient international tournament? Uh, that's That was the kicker for that. And I think we've got a lot of questions tonight too, uh, Matthew, about people sure. asking things around, you know, researching novels and, and where inspiration comes from and um, mm. all that sort of stuff. So I think that, that, that those you know, that's, that's really valuable to, to, to all of those people. Um, I would, I would, I would add to that too. Uh, sorry. I can't see the questions here. I'm, I'm terrified of pressing the wrong button and, you know, turning this off um, for inspiration. Yeah. I, I researched, I stationed at my local library in the Antarctic section. Um, I've traveled to Istanbul uh, looking at the, the Hagia Sophia or for Jack West to the pyramids, Stonehenge, Easter Island. I went to Chichen Itza in Mexico uh, just uh, about two years ago. Uh, That was for future research. Um, These things, this is all the inspiration. And, you know, you can't sort of stand in the shadow of Stonehenge or the pyramids and not be inspired. So if you can travel, but if you can't travel, which is going to be tough right now, read, read, read. Grab every nonfiction book you can. So this Christian Gerard, he's not like a friend or an informant of yours then? No, no. can't <laughs> say I know Christian. So but I think this, this, is, this is going to be an issue as, as the future unfolds. The notion of um, private mercenary armies. Uh, I think we're, we're on the cusp in some very poor nation, which is actually not new given the Dutch East Indies Company and the British companies of the 17, 1800s. I think we could have a company take over a whole country soon with armed force and they'll use one of these mercenary forces and uh, I, I, maybe it's already happening. Yeah. yeah. Well, so, so my question, another question to you and, and, and I'm mindful of the time it's 10 past eight. Now we've got, we've got another 20 minutes. But I will get to asking some of these, some of these other questions. Sure. Um, that's um, right. But, um, I just want to say, you know, so do you agree that if, if you dine with the devil, you need a very long spoon? Yes. <laughs> Have you dined with presidents and other um, major power brokers in the world? I, I once met Tony Blair and I, I met um, Princess Catherine. I was invited as a uh, representative of Australian sort of creative types to uh, meet her. Uh, she was very, very nice. We talked about Princess Elizabeth in the tournament. Fantastic. Um, now, we can never have a session like this uh, without the inevit- inevitable question of who would play Jack West Jr.? I've been thinking inevitably it'd be a Hemsworth, but I'm leaning more towards, towards Sam Worthington. And maybe Kevin Spacey is the Sphinx. God knows he needs the work. Um, mm. <laughs> have you had thoughts? And, and what do you say when people ask you that question? You know, Chris Hemsworth, is, is, he's been at the top of the list. In fact, any of the Hollywood Chrises pretty much get <laughs> to the top of the list lately. Chris uh, Pine, Chris Pratt, Chris Evans. Uh, what I do say is that actors get older very quickly. 
So you probably, given the time it would take, even say with the Jack West TV show, if that flies, they'd be looking for the new Sam Worthington or the new Chris Hemsworth, probably somebody a, a little bit younger as they get into their upper 30s. They're probably looking for someone in their late 20s. Now. So it wouldn't be like James Bond with a different one every couple of books. Well, I suppose maybe more like um, The Crown, that yeah. you could have a different, yeah, different age for different years. And, of course, there is the eight-year jump between Five Warriors and Four Kingdoms. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, we do have lots of other questions from people uh, in, in the audience, people who have already come in with questions. So I might just ask you some of these. Sure. I'll, I'll try like, to do them quickly. I'll we've try got to... about 20 minutes to go through some sure. of them. Um, from Amy, we've got a question. How many hours research does it take before you are ready to actually sit down and write one of the Jack West books? About three months um, for, for each. Uh, often I have the basic story, and I've had the basic story for three, two, and one in my head since I did Four Kingdoms, but you still do about three months of research and planning before I start. I can't believe anyone's head's got that much room to keep all of those. So those denouements in them. But, um, well, all power to you. Mary wants to know, how long did it take to, for you to write this, this latest one? So I started Two Lost Mountains. Well, to, to put it into to full context, I started it, I think, in about February of 2019. Uh, finished the first draft around September. So it's about sort of seven or eight months to do the first draft. Revised it from September, October, November, December, delivered in January. So took about 11 to 12 months to get to delivery. Uh, then my editor at Macmillan, you know, goes through it and keeps me honest and, you know, makes me, with the editing process, it's a question of usually over-explaining or under-explaining things. And then the book comes out in October. So uh, to write it, call it about 12 or 13 months and then there's another sort of five months of the editing and production process so it's nearly a two-year process have you had the same editor for uh, for for the whole series or have you had had quite a few different ones no no uh alex lloyd has been my editor for probably the last five or six books uh but that includes the great zoo of china and um and tournament and uh uh the standalines uh i have a the the only problem I have with editors is they usually get promoted. Uh, they, they, I get great editors and then they get promoted or they go to another publishing house because they're really good. Yeah. Now, we've also got some of those really, really Jack West Jr. specific um, series questions like this sure. is from J Julie. You dreamt Race would have a new manuscript to translate at the Q&A in the back of Temple. Will this be developed in the future? Yeah, you know, if I haven't done a sequel to a book, it's because I haven't come up with a better idea than the first one. And Temple and to a lesser extent Contest, they're really hard to do sequels to because I'm really happy with those books and I haven't come up yet with a... I had one notion for William Race, which actually involved sort of a, a lost Roman fort, but I haven't got the full story for it. So I'm really sorry, Julie. I... A William Race sequel is not on the cards anytime soon. Uh, I have thought of having him make a little cameo in a Jack West book, which could be kind of nice. And Darlene wants to know if you would, if you were to be str stranded, who would you want with you, Shane or Jack? Ooh, that's that's a really good question. Um, you know, probably Jack. Probably Jack. He's Got the titanium arm, which I think can come in handy. Um, and we could talk about Australian things because he's got the Australian background. <laughs> and we have a question here, which is from Renton, um, which, you know, I, yes, I think a lot of the writerly types will be thinking about, is it harder or easier to write during the COVID-19 lockdown? Oh, you know, there's, a, there's actually a more complicated answer to that. Uh, at first it was easier and then it got harder. Um, uh, as you probably found yourself, Neil, that, you know, you, 
when you suddenly have all the time in the world, you go, great, I can write, write, write. I actually sort of went a little bit too hard too early and I had to sort of rein myself in because the days are long during lockdowns and I, I sort of, uh, yeah, did a little bit too much writing. And so once I pulled it back and started pacing myself, now it is definitely easier. There are none of those sort of incidental meetings that pop up um, or you're not even leaving the house for them if you have a Zoom call with a movie producer or whatever. And so, uh, so yeah, the answer is it, at first it seemed easier and I went a little bit too hard too soon. Uh, and now I've sort of found my, my rhythm. Have you found that now? Um, yeah, I think I think that the last couple of months have become trickier and for a range of reasons. And I think I think uh, in a lot of conversations with people, you know, there's a sort of collective, I don't know, malaise that's starting to to creep in. Um, that that yeah. as a writer, you hope you can be sort of outside of, but you can't always. Um, yeah. On that same topic, Way has asked, besides not being able to do a book tour with the release of, of this book, um, you know, how, how has COVID affected the, the publicity and, and all of those attendant tasks? Yeah, I, you know, I miss the book tour and it's, it's nice to meet, meet readers at shopping malls and, and do these sorts of events in person. Uh, um, it's... I mean, I was supposed to go to the Margaret River Writers Festival back in May. That was the first thing this year that got cancelled for me. They cancelled that early on with the first lockdown. So it's, it's, it's affected, you know, just that. What I like about the books more so than, say, the movie stuff uh, is that what I write is what my readers interact with. And so when you meet a fan at a book signing, uh, they might be asking for my signature on a book, but in actual fact, it's just a connection between the person who wrote the words and the person who read the words. And that's the wonderful thing uh, about books. And, and that's the thing I miss the most. And unfortunately, in the COVID world, book signings with queues of people closely packed together or audiences, you know, packed into a room with hundreds of people just can't be done. Um, so I, I hope hope we get the vaccine and then we can do it all again. I think, I think the, your um, US lead is helping, hoping exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we've also got a uh, question. J Jake wants to know, will you be sad or relieved to finish Jack West's story with the next book? I'll be sad. Uh, I, I won't be relieved. I actually, I'm really looking, and I'm 260 pages into it into the one um it's a really big challenge to finish a series and i've really i researched television shows which were received well when they ended and also looked at the ones which were not well received when they ended and i was looking for patterns for the ones which were well received and i want to make sure that I go out with a bang and the last book is massive. I mean, the whole book is climax. So three, three secret cities, two lost mountains and the one are essentially one big story. And so the big challenge with two lost mountains was making it the connector story where Jack is really at his deepest, darkest place and really up against all the odds because the last book just is a rocket ship of a story. Uh, it is, and there is, there is going to be, comeuppance there are going to be showdowns and everybody is going to you're going to see all the characters and all these all you know in terms of character everything that these characters have been building towards for seven books is going to come to a head so now it won't be relief uh it's i've been building to this conclusion now for, for at least since four kingdoms so i'm really looking forward to it Sure. Many people are. We've also got a question from Karen. Are there any characters you've killed off now that you wished you hadn't? Not one. I've enjoyed <laughs> every one of them. And uh, <laughs> even that, that hate mail I still get for Scarecrow back in 2003, I, I, 
and you all know who it was and i i still i still get comments on facebook about it uh it's they these this is why i think people read matthew riley um and you know it's why we we enjoyed why i enjoyed watching something like game of thrones um nobody can be safe and that's um so no no i everyone i was i was i i did it knowingly and especially with that with the one from Scarecrow, I, I did it knowing I was going to cop something for it and I'm still copying it 17 years later. <laughs> so we're just kind of five. I think there's just like seven or eight more here. We've got about sure. eight minutes. So, um, yeah. And these are... So does that answer your any plans to get Scarecrow and Jack teaming up again? Can't tell you. Okay. Uh, there's a one book left. <laughs> is there a possibility of Professor William Race from the Temple making an appearance? Yes. Uh, will Sky Monster's name ever be revealed? Oh. Now this one is from this one from yeah, the last uh, the, one with the, 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 the answer to that can, one is is sooner than you think. Yeah. <laughs> so this was Jody. Will Sky Sky Monster's name ever be revealed? I have decided to call him George. He seems like a George. Uh, and when, oh, well, when she's asking, when will there be more signings? Well, I suppose that that is in the lap really of the gods, isn't it? <laughs> when you well, again. For, for Sky Monster's name, yes, that that is re will be re is revealed. Um, in terms of yeah, new signings and a tour. Uh, I mean, hey, I don't think we can do it until there's a vaccine. Um, I. I just can't and you know you I don't think we're going to be doing international travel till July of next year um so yeah maybe I mean you never know look at New Zealand New Zealand was hosting rugby games you know when they completely eradicated the virus so Australia more than any other country I think has a chance to do what New Zealand did and eradicate it so if there is a place where we could do the book signings and the book tours again it's Australia. So. Yeah. And one of the questions that quite a few people have asked is, what do you miss most about being in Australia? I, I miss sausage rolls. Um, <laughs> I, found, I found an Australian place in LA which sells sausage rolls, which is fantastic. Um, you know, I, I, at the risk of being philosophical, you know, uh, America and Australia look alike, but they're not alike. And America is really fueled by the individual. And I think Australia is fueled by the group. And I think it goes back to our history as a, a colony and at the edge of the world and you're all in it together. And uh, I came to the United States for, for work. I, I came here to further my, my movie goals. And hopefully I've got one of those goals coming to fruition very soon and for the action movies that I want to make I just couldn't do it in Australia just the budgets aren't big enough I, I needed to come to the US to do it uh, and so in that regard I'm I'm still very much Australian and I think there's there's so much of the Australian in me in the books not just the Jack West books with Jack being half Australian but even in the Scarecrow books uh, they couldn't be written by an American. They, they are written by an Australian who observes. Uh, and America. Mate, look, you know, making making an international Australian hero um, is kind of a, a, an act of heroism in itself, really culturally, which is yeah. which is is you know a great thing about Jack. Um, one of the other things, a more practical question that's comes up, and we sort of discussed it the other yesterday. Um, audio books. Now, I just we uh, we mentioned there which. Yeah. I know Borrow Box at the library will will have 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 it as soon as it's re released, but I think it's not being released through Audible and through the other platforms until the first is it of November. I think so. I think so. There, there's always been a lag with the audio books. Um, I assume they wait for the very very last uh, version of the novel. So I, I think I I approve the final proofs of the book in about August. So they only get it quite late and there's a lot of sort of production involved in it. 
Um, but yeah, it just always has a little bit of a lag. So my apologies. And I'll have to put up some of the uh, diagrams uh, for Two Lost Mountains on my website or something because I, I invariably get notes from people who read the audiobooks and go, I wish I could have had the pictures. Uh, this is a lot of them now are starting to have all of that, you know, like non-fiction yeah. things are starting to have them. So they're getting that technology. Yeah. We've, we've got we've got about four more minutes. So I think one of the other things I just wanted to yeah. um, ask you about was, um, um, let's see. Hey, I, I got all the time in the world. It's the middle of the night here now. I'm up. So. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Someone called Jack West has asked, do you still use only two fingers to type your manuscript? <laughs> oh, now that's harsh. That's harsh. I, <laughs> I, so I am a, on my left hand, I am a one finger typist, but I use all the fingers on my right hand. So I'm a six finger typist now. I'm a professional author. Thank you very much. <laughs> six fingers, not two. But yeah, left, left, my left hand is completely useless. If you really want to get into the, the minutiae of being a professional author, I am unfortunately a one-fingered left-hand typist. So you don't have to be a, you don't have to be a speed <laughs> typist to write a novel, which is great. No, for lots of people no. Well. Um, yeah, well, you've think... just really, you've really just pulled the curtain aside now, and it's laid Matthew Riley bare with that one. <laughs> Matthew, thank you so much. It's been a fantastic discussion. I think your fans will just be thrilled. Um, I think we've covered everything that they hopefully could have hoped to know in an hour. And I'm really sorry that I didn't get to everyone's questions. Um, obviously, we've had lots and lots of people uh, sharing tonight. Um, the, um, the, uh, the Two Lost Mountains can be... Um, purchased online from QBD bookstores or any of Geelong's other fabulous local booksellers. Um, it's published by Macmillan. Uh, copies of the book are also available from Geelong Regional Libraries in e-versions and hard copy. Uh, and the good news is that the libraries have reopened yesterday, albeit with a few restrictions still in, in place. But if you want to just mm. check the www.grlc.vic.gov.au for more details, you'll find them there. Um, do you have any parting words for us, Matthew? <laughs> you know, as, as I write in the interviews at, at the back of every book, I always end it by saying, uh, I just hope you enjoyed the book. I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm in the joy business. I, I want to give people enjoyment. And I think especially at this time, you know, there's a, there's a real place for escapism. So I hope you enjoy the two lost mountains. And uh, trust me, I am getting my skates on with the one and I'm I'm actually for those of you who come tonight I'm really hopeful that we might be able to get it out next year and not have you wait two years so that's a little gift for coming along today thanks for the gift thanks for the joy good night Matthew thank you thanks Neil <laughs>